he's going to talk about um, Hewlett Packard's relationship with Debian. So uh, I'll let you take the stage. Yeah, thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to be back with Ben Sometime while we're here, we have a slightly better dose of weather, but uh, at the same time, I don't think we'll have a lot of spirits inside here. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you have heard me talk about HP and Debian's relationship in the past? A few, yeah. <coughs> Even a few HP folks. Surprise, surprise. How many of you have never seen me in person before anywhere? Oh, hey, that's actually really gratifying. Um, <coughs> I love coming to the Debian conference every year in part because it's a place that I feel very comfortable. There are many people that I have known for many years and had the opportunity to work together with on interesting things. But part of what I have really appreciated the last few years is that in particular, this Debian day as a first day to kick off the official part of the conference uh, has provided a neat opportunity for us to sort of step back and talk about some things relating to the Debian project and how it fits into the larger ecosystem of free and open source software. Um, and that's, I think, gives us an opportunity to sort of <coughs> help explain uh, the project's place in the world a little bit. And I'm going to try and talk about that uh, in a slightly different way than some of the other presenters today, um, both because I personally have a long history of association with this project and with the whole idea of free software in general. Uh, made my first personal contribution of source code back in about 1979. And I've been involved with HP or uh, its spin-off Agilent Technologies since about 1986. So um, I, I've sort of had the opportunity to be one of the people who lived through the evolution and emergence of the Debian project and at the same time I've been part of HP one way or the other for a very long time. And as it says here, I've been working on Debian since about 1995. Actually, I first installed it sometime in 1994, but the, my, my real involvement in the project began right at the beginning of 1995. I did serve for a year as the Debian project leader back in the 2002 uh, sort of time uh, in history. And I continue to serve as chairman of the technical committee as well as being president of Software in the Public Interest, which uh, we'll, we'll have an SPI session on Monday, I guess. We have a board meeting that we're going to try and actually have the folks that are here uh, in person be meeting in person, and we'll be happy to take questions about SPI and answer questions uh, <coughs> about where we're trying to take that organization. Um, SPI provides a legal and financial umbrella for the Debian project in the United States, which is important for being able to hold trademarks and things like that. And I also, you know, build pieces of amateur radio satellites and play around with high-powered rocketry and all sorts of other fun things, which I occasionally allow to sleep into my sneak into my presentations. But you know, people ask me, um, so what exactly is it that you do? as chief technologist for open source and Linux at HP. And I spent, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about the right way to explain that. And I think the easy way to do it is actually to show you three quotations from wildly different places. The first one's from somebody that I only quote rarely and usually with great mirth, but this time it actually is sort of interestingly appropriate. And that's this quote from George W. Bush about three years ago when he said that my job is to, like, think beyond the immediate. I read that quote and I just had to laugh because this is, in some sense, part of what I think my responsibility at HP is. There are other people who worry about the budgets for the engineering activities that we're engaged in this very minute to try and deliver products in the next quarter. Um, my job is largely to be looking at longer term trends and behaviors and to help the company figure out what it should be doing to be in the right place at the right time to successfully participate in the larger free and open source software um, movement and to find interesting things to do. I also really love this quote from Evan Moglen from a talk that he gave at the Harvard Law School a few years ago where in speaking about the free software world, he said that we now have a body of software accessible to everyone on Earth, so robust and so profound in its possibilities. 
that we are a few man months away from doing whatever it is that anybody wants to do with computers all the time. And that's really very neat. That describes free software as, in effect, an infinite, an infinite range of possibilities. And then Dan Shearer, who I actually saw this morning for the first time in quite some time, threw out a quip at a conference in Australia a few years ago where he said there are so many clever things that could be done. And if you take this combination of things, trying to look a little bit beyond the immediate, this incredible breadth of things that can be done with free software, and then trying to pick the right set of clever things for the company to be involved in and trying to pursue as we navigate the free and open source future, that's really sort of what I do. But you know, enough about me. Let's talk about the larger uh, bits of HP. If there's only one thing that you remember from this presentation today, this is what I'd like it to be. HP.com slash go slash Debian. This is the sort of portal, launch page, home page, whatever your favorite word is, for finding out information about the products that uh, HP has specific Debian support kinds of things associated with it. Um, I'm now going to sort of jump away from this and talk a little bit about history, how we got where we are, what we actually do um, in terms of using technology from Debian and various products and some of where we'd like to go in the future. And then I'll wrap up by reminding you of this URL once again. So if you go back to the beginning of my personal involvement in the Debian project, around the end of 1994, the main Debian server was a machine called ftp.debian.org. And this was a PC under a student's desk at a university. He happened to be a student who was working in the university systems administration community, and as a result, uh, it was no big deal really for him to have an open source project machine sitting under his desk. But there were problems associated with this, um, not the least of which was that every time Debian had anything like a release, um, all of a sudden that university's network connections would be totally inundated with file transfer requests from people all over the world wanting to download newer software. And the university networking folks would get concerned. And every time they got concerned and dug into it and found out it, that it was this PC under this guy's desk, um, questions would get raised. And so Bruce Parents, who was very involved in the leadership of the Debian project at that time, was really concerned about the stability of the situation and asked me, since he knew I was managing a team inside the old test and measurement part of HP that maintained lots of systems and had lots of networking resources available to us, if I'd be willing to go grab a mirror copy of that system and just keep it sort of up to date and available in case something bad happened at the university and that machine got shut down or the connection got severed or something like that. And so I grabbed an old HP Vectra 486 tower PC that was on a pallet about to go out for scrap and stuck a SCSI controller in it, an ESA SCSI controller, for those of you who ever had the dubious pleasure of dealing with those things, and a couple of hard disks. And I love pointing out that at that time, the entire archive comfortably fit on a 660 megabyte SCSI drive with lots of room available for growth, and put a very early version of Debian on it. And that actually ran on an HP network connection from an HP data center in Colorado Springs for a number of years until we changed internal accounting rules for how we paid ourselves for the use of network bandwidth, and all of a sudden it became a high profile, visible thing that you know maybe should live somewhere else. But I love the fact that today, my management at HP likes uh, having me talk about that part of our early history, since of course at the time, I just happened to be a manager running a group who sort of had permission to do things like that. It's not like it was some huge corporate strategic decision involved. And then if you run the clock forward a little bit, in that same period of time, um, it had gotten slightly embarrassing that HP's PA risk processor architecture was sort of the last 32-bit CPU family that didn't have a real Linux port associated with it. And you know, there'd been lots of internal discussions in HP about you know, ways to do this, but frankly, a lot of individual contributors working in the company were worried that you know, if they started contributing to something like a Linux kernel port, that they might you know, get in trouble inside the company, particularly if they had previously worked on the HPUX kernel or things like this and maybe had access to information that the company wouldn't want them sharing publicly. 
Then this little group of consulting folks in, uh, I think we're all in Ottawa or Canada, called the Puffin Group emerged. And as a way of getting uh, attention for themselves and sort of making a name in the world, they announced that they were going to begin a PA Risk Linux port. It helped that some of them were real aficionados of that architecture and knew a fair amount about the systems, but it was also sort of a, a, a brave and audacious thing to do because uh, they were in effect diving in to try and port uh, Linux to a processor architecture that wasn't you know, completely well externally documented outside of HP. Um, but you know, through a, a happy series of coincidences and because of the amount of attention that this drew, by early the next year, in early 1999, HP had agreed to participate in the port. And the moment that announcement went out, there was this amazing effect on people working inside the company. Because now that HP had agreed to support the port of Linux to PA Risk hardware, individual contributors in HP felt free to go participate in the project and help make this happen. Um, and there were some explicit things happened regarding uh, permissions to make certain kinds of hardware information available and so forth um, that really aided that. And this was one of the, uh, this was a major sort of stepping stone in the history of HP's direct involvement in the Linux flavor of the free and open source software community. We've been very involved in other free software things previously. Uh, we've been supporters of the Internet Software Consortium and their bind and DHCP uh, demons and so forth for many, many years. But this is a really big deal in the history of HP's involvement with the Linux community. Not long after that, Linux Quick Care acquired the Puffin Group, and at that point, it wasn't just a fun project anymore. Uh, if work was going to continue, you know, somebody needed to get paid for it, and HP actually agreed to uh, put some money in so that tool chain and kernel porting activities could continue. Um, but you know, you get to a certain point, and it's like, okay, we have a working Linux kernel, we have a compiler and tool chain that work pretty well. But if anybody's ever going to actually use that, you need to have a Linux distribution around it, not just a kit of parts. And the reason that that distribution for PA Risk ended up being Debian was that while on one hand this port would be sort of irrelevant without a full distribution built from it, HP had already publicly announced the Itanium processor architecture as its future direction for many of its systems and that that was going to be replacing PA risk. And as a consequence, um, it, was, it was really hard to sell a commercial Linux distribution on the notion that they should make a big investment in porting their distribution to PA risk because they looked to the future and said, well, you know, this architecture is not going to be around forever. You've already announced what your plans are for transitioning to something else. Uh, if we're not going to sell millions and millions of units, how would we ever make back the, the money that we would put into uh, causing a port to happen. And so PA risk, the PA risk port was largely perceived as a community-driven activity and not something for which there was a, a really strongly articulated business need. And at the same time, uh, there were some key engineers in this group in HP who uh, were Debian developers or for other reasons uh, had gotten to know the project and liked it. Um, this was actually before I went back to work for HP full time to do Linux things, but uh, I knew a lot of the people who were involved and I would get invited as many other people would to participate in these hack fests that used to be organized uh, around the PA risk activities. Um, and at some point it was pretty clear that uh, if a distribution was going to happen and if it was going to happen in this kind of a community way, the Debian was probably a really good way to make that happen. And so when HP engaged directly with the Debian project to pursue the PA Risk Linux port, there were some things that were very clear, that this needed to be a real port. It, at that time, um, Debian had been ported to multiple processor architectures, but it had gotten nowhere near the state that it is today where you know, more architectures are supported than by any other distribution. And so there were lots of questions about how this could happen. And it was very clear that we wanted this to be a real Debian port maintained and merged fully into the Debian mirror network. And this was accomplished by hiring some more additional Debian developers. And at some point in that process, I ended up being one of those people. But also by encouraging some existing HP engineers 
uh, to go become more active in the Debian project and eventually to, to sign up and become registered Debian developers themselves. There are also some select investments made in specific features that were of interest. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but there's actually a, a relatively long history of HP be, being willing to step up and put a, a few hundred or a few thousand dollars here or there to help make various things that needed to happen happen. And then over the long haul of time, uh, the experience that HP gained working with Debian on the distribution port for the PA RISC processor um, sort of provided the context to make it easy for us to do Debian-related work um, for our, our, our Itanium-based servers when they were first being introduced and for many other things since then. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that the experience of building a relationship with the Debian project and figuring out what it took to be successful in engaging in a community-oriented uh, distribution activity had a lot to do with the attitude that HP's taken since then on how to approach the whole open source community development effort. It's a, it's a very conscious decision at HP to participate directly in open source development communities. In HP, we don't talk about working with the community. We talk about being part of the community. And as a result, we think of ourselves as citizens of this larger community, and we think about what the appropriate behaviors for citizens are who want to engage in social processes around this kind of community development. We try to support and align with existing community values and behaviors while focusing on developing those features and capabilities, particularly enterprise robustness features and capabilities that are particularly important to our customers. And I think one of the really sort of interesting subtexts here is that HP has so far never felt the need to create a new open source license just for us. Many of our competitors in the open source business world have created new licenses and used new and different licenses that people have had to go figure out and understand when they chose to release interesting pieces of source code into the open source community. Um, this approach of aligning and working with existing projects and making contributions to existing projects under the licenses they've already chosen has actually worked really well for HP. It means that um, we are one of the largest distributors today and one of the largest users of GPL version 2 within the enterprise world. And that's part of the reason that we've taken such an active role in the GPL v3 process with one of HP's senior legal counsel serving as the uh, initially as the co-chairman and more recently as the chairman of one of the discussion committees there. Um, it's a reasonably significant commitment on the company's part to that process. And while that process is not finished yet, we are all you know, hopeful that the end results will be good for, for us and for everyone in the community. And then we work with our Linux distribution partners, Debian and commercial distributions, um, and with independent software vendors to ensure that in the end we're delivering innovative and effective solutions that our customers can use. I went back and dug this slide out. You don't need to pour out all the details, but <clears throat> this is a slide that I took out of an old HP internal presentation that was used by the R&D manager of our internal uh, Linux support organization uh, to explain why it was that, that Debian was such an interesting thing for him to work with. And you know, trying to decode pictographic things is sometimes difficult, but the concept he was pointing to here is that when new hardware features are being developed and when new software functionality is showing up in the open source community, there is a time delay between when new things get invented and when they show up in a commercial stable distribution release. There's just the normal cycle time of when a Red Hat or a SUSE or someone like that schedules their stable releases. When you work back from those stable releases, there's some amount of time um, that's required uh, to bring new software functionality in, whether it's device drivers to support new hardware or new software features, get those integrated and stabilized and prepared for a release, and that there was a, a market opportunity represented by that time window between when new things first became available and when they showed up in commercial distributions. And as a hardware company, 
For HP, it would be very valuable to be able to provide working uh, Linux distributions and related tool chains to developers before our commercial distribution partners could necessarily get there with their completely stable releases and that there were opportunities when we were investigating and supporting new software to be able to deliver that faster if we had a lighter weight process for getting it out into the community. And then there's this notion that as the market matures, that gap might narrow because either the pace of innovation of new functionality would change or the rate at which things got integrated and smoothly delivered to customers might change. But this was actually sort of another flavor, not just this strong developer community relationship piece, but a real sort of sense of there being a time value of money market opportunity window uh, for making new functionality available by putting it on top of a community distribution that HP could be engaged in delivering just as quickly and efficiently as anyone else while we were waiting for our commercial distribution partners to run their normal cycle times. So in terms of things that have actually come out of this history of development relationship, if we run the clock way back to when the Itanium 2 servers were first being introduced, they used a new processor chipset called ZX1 that was developed at HP, and it took quite some time to get ZX1 support fully integrated into the kernel.org tree and for all of the 64-bit isms. It turns out that for various reasons, Itanium systems put more stress on some 64-bit porting issues than Alpha and other 64-bit architectures had previously, partially just because we were building systems that could handle gobs more memory than ever before and partially because that memory was often organized in HP servers in a sparse way across the address space where we actually ended up tickling higher order address bits faster and more furiously than some previous 64-bit systems. But the really intriguing thing is that we had full ZX1 chipset support and therefore Debian was installable and usable on HP's initial Itanium 2 server offerings in the Woody stable release, and that release was actually made before any of those systems shipped. That's something that we have never succeeded in doing with any other operating system, Linux or otherwise, is being in a situation where the operating system is actually shipping in a stable release form before the hardware starts shipping. Now, you can question the value of having something that's in a stable OS release before the hardware is even available, and in fact, our uh, Debian leadership has uh, established a set of criteria for adding new architecture support to the archive in the future that suggests that, you know, there, there needs to be hardware available that people can actually run this on before it's relevant. But I point to this as an example of something that it was possible to do through the tight development relationship that HP was maintaining with the Debian project, even at that point in history, that would have been difficult for us to accomplish any other way. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first time that we set, uh, the, I believe that was the first Spec FP 2000 record ever set by a Linux system, was set using Debian on an Itanium 2 server. We have, of course, since then focused most of our specsmanship work on the commercial distributions that we work with, but the first time we set a Spec FP record with Linux on an Itanium 2 server was done with Debian before the commercial distributions were available with support for that chipset. There was a thing that I was actually involved in helping to invent, which was an installation and software recovery tool set for Itanium 2 systems that was based on Debian. It was actually a Debian boot floppies instance with the RAM disk expanded and the hood jacked up and a few extra tools slid in and an extra layer of menu at the front end. Um, but people discovered fairly quickly that you could actually use one of those and if you knew the right magic words, you could successfully use it to do a Debian base install. And so I was very pleased that in later versions of that, we explicitly added do a Debian base install as a menu option. Um, some of the earlier carrier grade servers and HP's first entry into uh, Blade servers and uh, various uh, early access Itanium 2 uh, servers were all shipped with Debian pre-installs. That was often the default Linux that was made available for developers. Um, in almost all cases, those products have now been replaced by other more mature products in line, and many of those uh, ship with commercial distribution support these days. But um, there is still a substantial solution 
that HP has made, frankly, a lot of money uh, selling into the telecommunications market that is Debian with an HP customized kernel and a few additional utilities uh, running on top of a customized version of one of our Itanium server models that's now helping to make things like cell phone calls just work all over the world. Um, and then Debian's components have ended up being used in many products that HP ships that embed Linux technology. Uh, as a member of HP's open source review board, I have the ability to look into the database and review all the different places where uh, HP has had our products intersect with open source. And there are currently a couple hundred products shipping from HP that embed Linux and open source technologies of one kind or another. And in places where that's more than just a kernel or more than just one application being loaded on some other operating system platform, um, it's surprising how many of those are using Debian as the source for picking up the packages they need. One really good example of that is in the thin client product line, and you'll have to pardon the bill, this is a deck I pulled from you can tell the ones that were put together by marketing people. But um, <clears throat> in fact, a couple of the thin client folks are, are here. Uh, Michael's in the back room, you know, want to wave Michael. He's one of the architects from that team, and he's actually here this week to soak up as much as he can. And to, uh, I think we're hoping that sometime in this coming week, some of uh, this model, the T5725, will actually be here for folks to take a look at, play with, look under the hood with, and so forth. But these are. Um, sort of you know, self-contained, no moving parts uh, desktop or, or whatever client computing systems um, that um, have Debian in their guts and um, support customization of the image in the 5725. Some of the other more um, embedded products are also using Debian pieces in their guts, but at the same time, uh, they are doing it in a way where at the end of the day, uh, that's not part of what the customer worries about. It's just a product that works really well and solves a particular need, and the fact that we happen to be picking Debian technology to make that happen is you know, reasonably irrelevant to the customer. But the reason that they've ended up picking Debian is the same reason lots of other people do. Um, it has a lot to do with the availability of all of these packages of stuff. On any given day, nobody cares about all 15,000 of those packages. But the fact that there's somebody in the Debian ecosystem who does care about each of those packages and maintains it means that we all get to pick the subset of those 15,000 that matter to us and they're all there and they're all available. And it also helps that there's such a strong international developer and community support um, experience around the Debian project because it means that the internationalization support in Debian is much better than it might be otherwise. And of course, it doesn't hurt that at the end of the day, products that we build around Debian are able to be shipped royalty free. So let's fast forward to August of 2006. This is since the last time we had a Debian Developers Conference, but it's not the first time I've talked about this in public, of course. HP announced support for Debian on our ProLiant server family, and there are, in fact, also here this week, a couple of folks from our ProLiant server organization. I don't know if they want to smile and wave or not, but they had a lot to do with these cool shirts that I'm wearing and your organizers are wearing today, and which I hope many more of you will get a chance to see before the end of the week. Um, this was, I think, a really significant moment, certainly in the history of the Debian project, because you know this is a first tier server vendor offering real support for Debian on its principal family of servers that are of interest to Linux customers. And part of the reason that that matters is that HP ProLiance have been the market leader in um, worldwide x86 stuff for a long time, for about a decade, actually. And in fact, for the last nine years, since they first started counting, we have been the clear and undisputed leader in both number of units and revenue in sales of Linux servers worldwide as a company. So when HP decided to add support, explicit support for Debian to this product line, it's a big deal. And, you know, again, taken from one of our marketing decks, but I think worth mentioning anyway. When we talk about industry standard servers, there's industry standards, and then there's things that help to differentiate quality and value within that concept of standard. And part of what makes the ProLiant stuff interesting is that HP's made some significant investments in technology, everything from acoustics and thermal management to, to driving density and better cabling and 
and all sorts of interesting common components across the different product lines that allow us to drive volumes up and therefore get high reliability and reasonable economics across a wide range of form factors and different models. And when this Debian enablement activity started, there were really sort of two things that were going on. One was this notion that we wanted to make sure that if you were already an, a customer or an organization that had decided to use Debian, that there were no reasons that you would want to say, well, you know, we have to go somewhere other than HP to get this because, you know, it's not being officially supported. But then at the same time, we recognized that there were lots of customers that were also in heterogeneous environments who'd already made decisions to use some of HP's commercial management and support offerings. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it was possible to use Debian systems well there. So it's sort of a two-pronged motivation. One is, if you're a Debian user, we want to make sure that there's no reason that you don't also want to be a ProLiant user. But at the same time, if you're already a big HP customer, we want to make sure there's no reason that you aren't comfortable also using Debian. And so there are all sorts of value-added components that came as part of this product. These are sort of normal things that the ProLiant folks do. And what it really comes down to is making sure that all the device drivers and management agents and so forth are available and tested uh, for the combination of these different systems and Debian. And one of the things I particularly wanted to point to is this thing called Insight Control Linux Edition. For those of you who follow the events in terms of mergers and acquisitions and so forth, a while back HP acquired this company called RLX, which was one of the first companies in the Blades marketplace, and they had a product called Control Tower, which was a management interface for managing Blades. The th reason I wanted to mention this is not only is Insight Control Linux Edition an interesting tool to use for getting a management view of a bunch of Linux systems, but it's actually based on Debian. Insight Control Linux Edition is a Debian, mini Debian system with all sorts of other things running on top of it, which folks don't always notice. It's another one of those examples of a place where this is the right technology for putting a product together that works well and solves a real problem. And at the end of the day, it's not for the end user about the fact that this is Debian. But for those of us in the Debian community, it's really cool when we notice that the stuff that we've worked on for all these years is helping to solve yet another interesting problem. And so there's all sorts of things that have happened. There's been a process of getting through uh, the qualification uh, testing with uh, Debian Sarge using 2.6 kernels. Uh, that's pretty much complete now, and tr uh, effort has transitioned to working with uh, Etch. I understand that you should watch our website starting probably sometime in July uh, to start seeing Etch uh, qualification results showing up. That's just the typical lag time after a new release that it takes our testing organizations to get things scheduled and done. Uh, it's not that I'm aware of anything there that's a problem. Um, many of us are actually running Etch quite happily on these servers today and have been for some time. Um, but I wanted to point out that even things like the ability to do uh, firmware updates on the servers from a running system and other things that aren't always part of sort of, you know, the base process of making a distribution work on a box are things that we're trying to support. And so if you want to know what's available today, I did a little quick cut and paste of um, bits and pieces from the web page this morning. It doesn't look exactly like that, in other words. But if you go to that hp.com slash go slash Debian, there are a bunch of places you can from there click off to. And one of them is a support matrix that will show you for different models of HP ProLiant server what pieces are and aren't available, what things are coming soon, and so forth. There's another site that I wanted to really point out, and again, this presentation slide set will be available for you to download or look at online later if you want. You don't have to scribble notes. But there's actually an HP ProLiant page within the Debian uh, wiki structure, uh, which is <coughs> an effort at uh, aggregating community information about these systems as well. HP folks contribute to that, but others within the Debian, uh, larger Debian community are more than welcome to contribute, experience things there as well. And there's various other stuff that's downloadable from HP. And then beginning on the 1st of December last year, part of this whole support offering is that it is actually possible to buy from HP the same kinds of support products 
um, that are available for other Linux distributions and for other operating systems on these hardware platforms and to buy them specifically for Debian as well. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but in this presentation deck are these slides that have the specific part numbers that you can buy from HP to get those different kinds of support if you want to. You can find all of those from the hp.com go Debian website if you follow that particular path of mouse clicks and rodent droppings, but I thought I'd stick them in here to make them easier for you to find. And I mentioned earlier this HP uh, product, which is Debian GNU Linux plus HP Telco extensions. I wanted to mention this again just because, even though you may never actually physically see one of these systems, because they're mostly being sold to uh, communication service providers who are putting them into functions in their core networks, and as a result, these are not the kind of things end users see, there's about a 30% chance um, that any cell phone call that you make anywhere in the world today is somehow going to touch one of these systems in some way. I just think that's pretty cool. I think it's cool that Debian is a core component of how many of the world's uh, telecommunications providers are now building and deploying services. To them, it's not Debian per se that's important. It's the fact that there's a large number of nines, high availability, Linux-based solution available on hardware that meets their expectations. But along the way, somebody noticed and discovered that Debian's distribution was a good thing to build that on and that it would work well and be able to solve the problem. And as a result, there's an awful lot of it out there. So once again, if there's only one thing that you remember from my standing up here today, other than HP's done some kind of cool shirts, <coughs> It's this, hp.com slash go-debian. This is the place to go to look to see what we're working on and what we're doing. There are lots of other HP externally facing sites like opensource.hp.com where you can get a wider view of the various activities that HP is engaged in the open source community. But when it comes to what we're doing with Debian and how that's turning into specific product and support offerings that are relevant to our customers, and they are relevant. We've sold some fairly interesting support contracts to customers who are running Debian. And just last night, I got taken out to dinner by a customer who just bought oodles of our Blade servers to run Debian on and uh, is looking forward to spending some more time this week talking to us about how we could get that stuff even better. And so, you know, this is a good place to go to find out that sort of information if you want. I'm going to close with one thought. I, I, you know, as someone who's been involved in Debian for a long time and tried to provide some vision and thought leadership at various points, there is a challenge that we have faced through this whole process, and that is that Debian doesn't have a certification test suite. This kind of makes it tough for companies that are used to working with commercial distributions to figure out exactly what it is they need to do to quote unquote support Debian. And I think it's uh, this work that Arjen van de Ven at Intel has done on the Linux Ready Firmware Developer Kit has been really interesting in this regard. This, how many of you are aware of this? Have you, have you heard of this developer's kit before? Anybody other than Keith? <laughs> okay, well I'm glad I mentioned it then. This is really neat. This is something you can go download and run on a system and it will tell you whether that system's BIOS is doing things the right way to support Linux or whether there are issues. And at the end, it's basically an automated set of tests and gives you a report. This has been amazingly empowering to BIOS developers at hardware companies all over the world because now all of a sudden they can go, oh, that's what I need to do. There's no longer any sort of funny questions about what does it mean to build a system that's going to work with Linux. They've got a simple thing they can run and get the answer. So it makes me wonder whether Debian should engage in offering some specific additional tests to that suite, if that's something BIOS developers and so forth are already going to be running and using. And it also caused me to wonder, um, from a sort of Debian PR kind of standpoint, if it would be worth creating a Debian branded derivative of something like that toolkit with more tests that are specifically relevant. I don't know. This is an idea I'm actually throwing out more to the Debian developers in the audience today than to those of you who are just here to figure out what we're all about. But this is the kind of thing that I think could help to make more companies 
that are involved in providing hardware and support services that might be interesting to have as part of the larger Debian community and ecosystem in the future uh, understand what they need to do to be able to do that. So with that, uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you for your attention. Does anyone have something they'd like to ask? And I have a, there's a mic in the center of the room and I have this one I can hand out either. So go ahead. So could you summarize the different ways that H, whoa, oops, hello, check. So could you summarize the different ways that HP makes money with Debian? Yeah, so how does HP make money with Debian? Um, it, a lot of it's indirect. A lot of it has to do with the fact that by using Debian in an embedded product, for example, if the alternative was to go to some other Linux distribution or some non-Linux operating system where we would have to pay some amount of upfront money to acquire the software or where we would have to pay a royalty, then there's a sort of an operational expense improvement by not having to pay that by using Debian. In the case of these support offerings, it's that we hope we're selling more units of hardware than we would otherwise sell that people will buy from HP who wouldn't otherwise have bought from HP because this is something we've done. We'd love to directly sell more support contracts. If people are putting Debian servers into real IT production use, we're having somebody, Clueful, who's willing to answer the phone 24 hours a day, any day of the year, anywhere in the world, would be a useful way to raise that customer or that IT shop's confidence in using Debian to deploy that, then that could be a valuable thing and worth paying somebody like HP for. Um, and then in places like this telco thing, it's a key component of enabling us to pursue a market opportunity that we might not have been able to afford to pursue otherwise. Um, and that's an example of where we went to our commercial distribution partners and we said, hey, you know, we see this market opportunity, we're gonna go build this custom piece of hardware to go pursue this opportunity. It requires building a kernel that has a bunch of stuff that the kernel.org guys don't really like, um, and yet, you know, we can make money on this. Do you want to go there with us or not? And they said, well, feel free, and if you're successful, maybe we'll follow you there someday. So those are the kind of places where working with Debian can actually bring real money into the company, even if it's sort of indirectly. So uh, obviously GPL v3 isn't finalized yet, but do you have a sense as to HP's corporate uh, direction regarding v3? Well, I think um, th there are things that are concerning for a company with a large patent portfolio in v3, and we have raised our concerns through the process, and frankly I'm very pleased that the language in the final draft that we've seen, the final call draft, is is better for us than some of the preceding ones. But at the end of the day, I think it's, uh, it's gonna be another interesting license in the landscape. I don't think we're gonna have any strong reason to dry, try and drive people to adopt or not adopt the license. Um, you know, frankly, our history has been largely with GPL v2, and unlike a lot of other folks, we've been very comfortable using v2. So some of the pressures that drove people to want to create a v3 are pressures that I don't think we really felt. And yet, if the community wanted to pursue a new license, we thought the right thing to do is to try and participate actively and you know, have that license in the end be as, as useful and as good a license as possible. I will comment that <clears throat> I think there was this hope in the beginning of the V3 process that somehow when we got to GPL V3, that there would be this wonderful unifying consequence of revisiting the terms of the GPL. And I'm afraid that what's happened instead is every time some specific issue came up for discussion, people who previously were willing and able to work with each other within a community, even if they had differences of opinion on that particular point, when that point came up for explicit discussion, now people had to take sides and decide how they felt about that. And so part of this process has actually been a series of divisions where Lots of people who sort of work together under the GPL v2 umbrella have had to say, yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna like this better or not. And I'm hoping that eventually a lot of those sorts of divisions get rehealed, that once the license is stable and solid and people start to use it and understand it, that some of that sense of community will reform around it. But I think it's way too early to tell what's gonna happen there. And of course, you know, the final call draft, we don't know. I hope there are no further substantive changes in the text before the final, but this is the FSF and RMS we're talking about, so who knows. <laughs> That's right. Are there any thoughts about um, taking HPUX and making it open source? 
Uh, there are thoughts about that on a regular basis, and I would not expect it anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, the, we find ourselves in this interesting situation where we have a market-leading position in the Linux market and a market-leading position in the Unix market, and they're actually different markets with different expectations, and that would be a whole other talk and could be very interesting, but um, it's not one that we have time for today since they're you know, waving hooks at me from the back of the room. So, um, no, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. <clears throat> And frankly, uh, personally, I'd rather see our Linux offerings just continue to grow in relevance and both financially and technically till that question's just not relevant anymore. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time and your attention. I will be here all week. In fact, my family's joining me on Tuesday sometime, and we're all going to be here towards the end of the week. So if you have other questions or would like to ask me more about the history of either the Debian project or those parts of HP that I've been involved in, feel free to find me and ask. I'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you much.